Since the Reformation in 1560, Scotland's national church had been Presbyterian. John Knox and his associates had completed the work of changing Scotland from Roman Catholicism to Protestantism. The Scots felt that their pure religion of biblical worship and doctrine, along with their liberty, which had cost them so much, was worth fighting for. In this presentation, Reverend Sinclair Horne will tell the story on location at historic sites in the city of Edinburgh of the bravery, suffering and martyrdom of the Covenanters of Scotland. My name is uh, Reverend Sinclair Horne. For 44 years I was Secretary Lecturer of the Scottish Reformation Society. Over the past three years I've been the Honorary Curator of the Magdalen Chapel which is owned by the in the Scottish Reformation Society. We, we seek to make known the principles of the Reformation through visitors coming to the chapel here and we enjoy meeting and sharing the, the knowledge of that truth uh, with them. We are here in St Giles Cathedral in the heart of the old city of uh, Edinburgh. St Giles has been a notable church down through the centuries, but there is a, a part of history that is very important that we want to take up in this film. This is the church where John Knox was minister, and very many things in the, in the course of the Reformation took place here in St Giles Cathedral. We want to focus on John Knox today because his part in the work of a reformation in Scotland is very noteworthy. John Knox was a man who trained as a priest. He came to this situation through his friendship with one of the pre-reformation heroes, George Wishart. George Wishart had come from the, north, the northeast of Scotland to Edinburgh and he began a preaching tour in, down near the area of the docks in Edinburgh and John Knox saw him, listened to him and it became his, his friend. And from that point onwards, throughout the remainder of George Wishart's ministry, John Knox was instructed and helped to understand what Reformation was all about. And he joined the Reformation band, as it was known, and became the helper and co-worker with the George Wishart. After the death of George Wishart, John Knox had to leave Edinburgh and go to St Andrews and he went to St Andrews with his, what was known as his boys who he was teaching and he stayed in St Andrews for a number of months and it was there he began his actual ministry. He began teaching in St Andrews. But something happened in St Andrews that was very significant and important. John Knox attended the parish church in St Andrews and at one of the services, the, the minister, at the close of the, his message, aimed a direct uh, d a desire that John Knox should become a minister of the gospel. And it was there in St Andrews that John Knox became a, a minister of the gospel. He toyed with the idea the, for a whole week in, in agonizing uh, concern that he was doing the right thing. But he came to the, the church in St Andrews on the following Sunday and he preached a sermon. And when he preached that sermon, people knew just exactly where John Knox stood. It's the only thing in the publications of, on, on John Knox that we have any idea of what his situation was. Uh, there's a lot of his biography and, uh, and other things, but this was a very important sermon that he preached and it was to mark him down 
as one of the great reformers. Up to this point, the three men that were involved in the Scottish Reformation were Patrick Hamilton. And Patrick Hamilton was what we would call more of an evangelist in his day. And then there was George Wishart, and he was a teacher. But in John Knox, we had all three things of it. Teacher, preacher, and also organizer. And from there on, John Knox labored faithfully for Jesus Christ. You would notice in these pictures that in the pictures of John Knox, there is one notable feature, and that is that he is holding the Bible. And that is one of the, the wonderful things about John Knox, that everything that he did was in accordance with God's Word. Here we've got a, a, a picture which uh, illustrates something of the, 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 the form that John Knox the, had in preaching. Uh, he had a, a very small pulpit, uh, but he was able to uh, make his voice heard and make his emphasis clear and people responded to it. John Knox left Scotland and, uh, for a time and he was in England and then he went over to the continent and to uh, Geneva and it, it was there that the, the, some of the greatest things happened to, to John Knox. He became a, a very close friend and an associate uh, of John Calvin. And that formulated in his mind a form of doctrine that was similar to what uh, his own was, uh, and, and from Calvin. And he came, to, came back to Scotland and they began to preach the message that there was to be the herald of the Reformation. He came home to Scotland in the late uh, 1550s and he saw that the, the groundwork here in Scotland had been done and that there were, there were preparations for a work of reformation. And John Knox brought in his organizing uh, aspect of his life in the, the work that he did. He was one of the men who uh, formulated and had printed the Scots Confession which was to be one of the great books uh, at the time of the Scottish Reformation. He also did a, a number of things that was, were to be aids when the Reformation came eventually. The Reformation came in 1560, December the 20th, 1560. John Knox had called a General Assembly. 42 men attended that assembly they were in tune with John Knox's views and his desires to see Reformation in Scotland. And they, they sat for two weeks in the Magdalen Chapel, and then the, the work progressed and went out into the country. The banner of the Reformation was held aloft throughout the main part of Scotland, and there was a great response to, to the, the work that was being done by those men who had been appointed as ministers. John Knox became minister here in St. Giles. And uh, that it, it was a different church to what it is here today, but John Knox ministered here from 1560 to 1572 and he had a wonderful ministry here in Edinburgh. This, the picture that you see uh, is, is very interesting indeed because it gives a, an indication of the way that people gathered around John Knox when he was preaching. And uh, it said that the people could occupy themselves. One man says that he, he wrote down the notes for the first 20 minutes or 30 minutes of his message, but he couldn't do any more after that because of the earnestness of John Knox's preaching. 
So here was a very interesting uh, aspect of things. So John Knox, he had to leave for, for certain periods of time because of illness and so on, but he did continue until 1572. And, but he, he, has, he left a legacy of great, great worth. And in his last days at his house, John Knox uh, met with the elders and deacons from the churches in Edinburgh, and he began to talk to them of his work and his ministry. And he left one very wonderful saying, and it was this, I know that many do blame me and do blame my too great rigor and severity. But God knows that in my, in my heart, I never hated the persons of those against whom I thundered God's judgments. I hated only their sin and labored according to my power to bring them to Christ, who placed me in this function of the ministry and will call me to an account. These were among the last words that John Knox spoke to the general public. And I think they're a very wonderful reminder of the caliber of the man and the sincerity of his ministry. The struggle for religious and civil liberties during the 1600s was not with Romanism, but with the Episcopalians of England. The British monarchy, which held both religious and civil authority, tried to force its prayer book and church government of archbishops, bishops, deans and church laws upon the people of Scotland. St Giles has also been in the news, as, as they would say, of the church in Scotland over many, many years. And one of the most amazing in incidents in the church history that's enshrined here in the St Giles took place in uh, 1637. At that time, the king was trying to take over the aspect of the government of the church. He had produced a document that was to be a source of conflict as far as the people of Scotland was concerned. They, they saw that there was going to be a conflict between Presbyterianism, where Jesus Christ is counted as head of the church, and Episcopacy, where the, the king is head of the church. And it came to a head one time when the dean was to read from this document that they had been prepared and there was a woman in the congregation by the name of Janet Geddes, or Jenny Geddes, as she'd become known. And she took the three-leg stool and she threw it towards the dean as he was reading. She uttered the words in this Scottish brogue, villain, ye wanna say mass in my luck. You won't say mass in my ear. And that was a, a starting point for the, the work of the, the covenanting situation in Scotland, where the assertion of the crown rights of Jesus Christ was made by the covenanters. When King Charles I and his successors endeavoured to force the Scots to conform is when the conflict became severe and even bloody. For over 50 years, the Scots fought a long and bitter fight until 1688, when they succeeded in re-establishing Presbyterianism in Scotland. After the episode of Jenny Geddes in St Giles, things moved very quickly. Some six months after the, the episode, men were drawn from different parts of the country and there was drawn up what has become known as the National Covenant of Scotland. This document was a, a document outlining the desires of the Presbyterians in Scotland at that time to preserve the, their rights and also to extol the right of the, to recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ over the church. And that lasted for another 60 years. The struggle was intense and there were many difficulties that had to be overcome. 
The grass market was originally a place where local farmers brought their produce for sale. It also functioned as a place of public executions, where many martyrs and covenanters died. This led to the local tavern located next to the scene of public hangings being named The Last Drop. The exact spot where the gallows once stood is marked by St Andrew's Cross in the cobblestones, bearing the inscription, For the Protestant faith, on this spot many martyrs and covenanters died. There is also a memorial plaque that recalls many of the men and women who sacrificed their lives. Many of the men who were executed at the grass market, not far from here, and this is where they, they were buried. It's very interesting to t tell the story of a, a lady uh, who was so anxious about those uh, uh, men of the covenant being identified with the, the rogues and rascals that had been uh, executed uh, at the grass market uh, and, and were just thrown into the open grave here. She wanted them to be recognized as Christians and to have a Christian funeral. And she took in hand to dress the bodies of the Covenanters uh, in the Magdalen Chapel and they were given a Christian burial here at Greyfriars. This stone gives us a, a very clear message of what the Covenanting struggle was all about. And the stone shows to us something of the dedication and devotion of those men and women also who laid down their lives for the crown rights of Jesus Christ. Their lives were sacrificed unto the lust of prelates subdued, though here their dust lies mixed with murderers and the other crew, whom justice justly did to death pursue. But as for them, no cause was to be found worthy of death, but only they were found constant and steadfast, zealous witnessing for the prerogatives of Christ their King, which truths were held by famous Guthrie's head and all along to Rennick's blood. They did endure the, the wrath of enemies, reproaches, torments, death and injuries, but yet they are those who from such troubles came and now triumph in glory with the Lamb. From May 27th, 1661, that the most noble Marquis of Argyll was beheaded, to the 17th February, 1688, that Mr. James Rennick suffered, were one way or other murdered and destroyed for the same cause, about 18,000 of whom were executed at Edinburgh about an hundred of noblemen, gentlemen, ministers and others, noble martyrs for Jesus Christ. The most of them lie here. We are now standing at the gates, marking the spot known as the Covenanters Prison. Now that takes us back to 1679, when over 1,000 prisoners were taken at the Battle of Bothwell Bridge and brought here and given accommodation in this open field. It was an open field in those days and they were here for four months. Many of them suffered greatly, many, many of them died, but they were here and they gave indication of their loyalty uh, to the Covenanting cause. There's a very sad part about the imprisonment that ended after these four months was that the last 200 prisoners were taken from here and taken down to the seaport of Edinburgh, Leith, and put on a ship intending to take them to America. And going through the Pentland Firth in a storm, the ship foundered and most of the prisoners uh, because they were uh, bolted down in the hold, uh, were drowned uh, in, at that place. And today there is a monument in the Orkney Islands to the memory of those men who died uh, at that time. Before the fight was finished, about 18,000 of all classes, rich and poor, men, women and children, had been martyred or banished from the land for their faith. In 1638, 
the National Covenant was signed by scores of Scottish believers affirming their determination to fight and even to die for religious and civil liberties in Scotland, both for themselves and for generations as yet unborn. This document on the wall is one of the things that happened after the episode with Jenny Geddes. Several men of outstanding quality uh, came together and decided to d draft what has become known as the National Covenant of Scotland. And this is a facsimile uh, of that covenant. In that covenant, they set, set out the principles that they stood for as far as their reformed position was concerned and also uh, they highlighted their Presbyterian position. They also gave a place to the, the king and acknowledged that they gave him his rightful place as the ruler of the country, but not as the head of the church. And that document was taken to Greyfriars Church and Churchyard. And first of all, the nobles of the country signed it in the church. Then it was taken out into the churchyard and ordinary people were able to sign this national covenant. Some were so desperate to sign it that they didn't wait for the writing materials, but they signed it by just cutting a, a vein in their, their, their hands and signed it with their own blood. So this was a, a moving episode in the, the situation of the church in Scotland in the 1600s. And this is what brought about the story of the Scottish Covenanters. We are in the old Magdalen Chapel, the very last church to be built before the Reformation uh, here in Edinburgh, and a church that has stood since 1541. It began as a Roman Catholic church, a private Roman Catholic church. It became the church where the reformers held the first General Assembly. And since then, it has had a, a checkered career in the way in which it has served so many different uh, branches. It was a non-denominational building, but eventually it became an interdenominational building by the, the way that it gave service to uh, different groups who wished to use it for their services. But the important part that we are thinking about it links itself to John Knox once again, because it was here that John Knox brought the 42 men to form the first General Assembly. They met here from the 20th of December, 1560, till the 18th of January, 1561. The program that they had was an, an extensive program and they managed to get through all the things that they had planned. John Knox had laid the foundation for it. Indeed, he had made all the plans and brought what was known as the first book of discipline to be the order for the General Assembly. And it was here that they, they set out very clearly and very positively the reform position in Scotland at that time. There was a lot that they had to learn. The Reformation in Europe had been going on for quite some time before this, and they had uh, made their, their mark, and John Knox was determined that this would happen here in Scotland as well. The one thing that they were very concerned about was by the means of communication, and John Knox took great pains to show that education came very largely into the forefront of the plan. He said at one point that the, the education was not the privilege of the few, but was the right of all. And that meant not just young people, but ex it extended to adults as well, because he was anxious that all would be able to read the scriptures for themselves and so establish a reformed society in Scotland. That assembly finished 
and the Magdalen Chapel became uh, a centre then uh, for preaching and other things until into the 1578 when a second General Assembly took place and it was at this General Assembly that Presbyterianism was inaugurated. Andrew Melville brought the assembly here to the Magdalen Chapel and he had the second book of discipline and he worked on, on this and established Presbyterianism as the form of church government for the church, the Reformed Church in Scotland. And today, Presbyterianism stretches right across the, the whole of the world and it's at so many different places that you can see something of the value that uh, came from uh, both the first General Assembly and the second General Assembly. At the present, the chapel is used uh, as a, a meeting place for uh, a small fellowship and we also have Bible study meetings here and we invite uh, visitors to come and to share with us something of the wonderful story of the Magdalen Chapel. There are many things that, that interest historians and the, the, those who are interested in uh, aspects of uh, the development of uh, different systems in Scotland and we enjoy uh, meeting folks here and sharing the story of the Magdalen Chapel. It's a, a wonderful place. It's a place that we believe uh, God is blessing and uh, using for His glory at this present time. In the chapel here, we still have part of the old mortuary table that was used at the time of the Covenanters. A lady by the name of Helen Alexander, a lady who had herself been imprisoned for adhering to the views of the Covenanters. She, when she was released, wanted to do something that would identify the Covenanters much, much more readily. And she was the one who devised the plan that the, the bodies of the Covenanters, when they came from the, the place of execution, uh, were to be dressed for burial. And this is the, the, the old table on which they, they were dressed for burial uh, in the chapel here. And uh, she uh, arranged for the burial services to be held in the Greyfriars churchyard and they were given a Christian burial. The world in which we live today would be very different had there not been men, women and even children willing to die for the purity of the Christian faith and the crown rights of Jesus Christ. The Covenanters of 17th century Scotland believed that the true church had but one king, Jesus Christ, and they were willing to suffer and die for their belief. This has been a production of Truth in History, in cooperation with Reverend Sinclair Horne of Edinburgh, Scotland, who was Secretary Lecturer of the Scottish Reformation Society for 44 years.